Imagine it's 20,000 years into the future, and humanity has discovered a creature not only revered as a deity, but also creates a substance so powerful, it grants supernatural powers and sparks wars that kill billions. That is the reality of Dune's sandworms and spice. In fact, by the time House Atreides arrived on Arrakis, Melange had become the single resource that was capable of creating or destroying an empire paralleling our world with oil. But how was spice discovered and where do these creatures come from? As planet Arrakis used to be a green planet with lots of water before the introduction of sandworms. The Fremen have a prayer. Bless the maker and and his water. Bless the coming and going of him. May his passage cleanse the world. May he keep the world for his people. The Fremen consider the worms to be more than large, dangerous animals. They are physical manifestations of their god. The maker prayer acknowledges the world-shaping power of the worm. It's a prayer that they say when they see a worm rising to the surface because they know that spice will be spread across the sand. However, although the sandworms we get to see are miles long and huge, their life cycle begins through small little creatures called sand planktons. The first dune ecology appendix tells us that these were microscopic protozoa-like organisms which were spread throughout by already mature sandworms. These things would feed upon the spice in the desert sands and slowly move to the next phase called little makers or sand trouts. They're described as half plant, half animal deep sand vectors. Basically, they are more like slugs or leeches at this point rather than full-on worms. Imperial planetologist Pardot Kynes discovered sand trouts during her investigations, but Fremen kids have been playing around with these things far long before then, approximately thousands of years. They even wear sand trouts like living gloves due to their leathery nature. In fact, the sand trouts are the reason for Arrakis becoming a desert planet because their sole purpose is to move around the planet and and block off water into little cysts. This causes it to be removed from the natural water cycle of the world leading to ecological collapse towards desertification. Paul's sister Aaliyah in book 3, Children of Dune, informs us that when you link sand trouts edge to edge against a planet's bedrock, then they start forming tanks of water, depriving the world of its moisture. But that's not all. In book 3, we also learn the origins of these worms. Paul's children, Leto II and his sister Ganima were pre-born, which means they had the memories of all their ancestors. So when they venture into the desert to find this place known as Chakarutu, he keeps getting visions and memories of his father Paul who implores him to go deeper within his consciousness, where we learn that the worms aren't native to Arrakis, someone put them there. There is a theory in the community about the possibility of alien intervention, which could be an explanation for sandworms reaching Arrakis, especially since by the year 13 1728 AG, with God Emperor Leto's plan to cause the scattering, which was a mass migration for survival, humans eventually ventured out further than the known universe and discovered different galaxies than the Milky Way, so there must be other life around, right? However, who could have done this? As for the sand trout to exist in the events of the first few books, there would need to be another planet similar to Arrakis in the universe, but in the entire galaxy, there is none like it. As a result, humans finding Arrakis is very us, where a few hundred Arulian exiles over 10,000 years ago stumble upon it on their journey to find a new planet for their kind, which changed everything. Prior to the discovery of Spice's prescient powers, the use of the space folder was very dangerous. This was so dangerous that 1 in 8 space folders were destroyed during travel because of the lack of viable method for avoiding gravitational hazards. Paul's sister Aaliyah says in Children of Dune that Spice is often called the secret coinage. Without Melange, the Spacing Guild's highliners could not move. Without Melange and its amplification of the human immunogenic system, life expectancy for the very rich degenerated by a factor of at least four. Even the vast middle class of the Imperium ate diluted melange in small sprinklings with at least one meal a day. Now, it's important to mention that the sand trouts are the ones that create spice, not the worms. Deep within the sands, thousands, even millions of sand trouts interlock within a pocket of water. When their fungal excrements come in contact with it, a gaseous reaction occurs which bubbles 
blows up into a great big spice explosion bursting through the surface of Arrakis, bringing this mixture into the sun to be dried and turned into melange. Essentially, during the Butlerian Jihad, conscious robots started a war that began in 201 BG and concluded in 108 BG. All thinking machines were hunted down and destroyed, with a commandment against their ever being used again. Thou shalt not make a machine in the likeness of a human mind. That is the result of the Butlerian Jihad. The machines revolted and created a virus that almost wiped out humanity. So instead, humans started relying on this super drug to do their math, gain superhuman psychic powers, and navigate spaceships for interstellar travel. Spice in some humans can also unlock prescience, a form of precognition based on genetic, made possible by the use of the drug in larger doses. It's an ability to see into both the past, present, and future. People are capable of various levels of it. Prescience makes safe and accurate interstellar travel possible. Guild navigators use such abilities. However, melange is also highly addictive and withdrawal is fatal. To the Fremen, spice is part of their culture, where they create paper, plastics, and chemical explosives with it, even going as far as making spice cloth and spice fiber rugs. Melange can also be mixed with foods, as we saw in the movie where Paul eats it. Other things include spice coffee, spice beer, and spice liquor. Interestingly, by the events of Dune, the spice is used all over the universe and is a sign of wealth. Duke Leto Atreides notes that of every valuable commodity known to mankind, all fades before melange. A handful of spice will buy you a home on Tupli. Later on, we learn that a suitcase of spice can buy you an entire planet. Due to this value, the Emperor's power is secured by his control of Arrakis, which puts him on equal footing with the houses of the Lancerot and even the Spacing Guild. Extensive use of spice causes a person's eye color to a dark shade of blue, called blue and blue, or the eyes of Ibad, which is something of a source of pride among the Fremen and a symbol for their tribal bond. Paul initially has green eyes, but after several years on Arrakis, they change. Paul tells us that spice is a poison, so subtle, so insidious, so irreversible, it won't even kill you unless you stop taking it. Its color varies from pale orange and mounds of dark reddish brown. As for the smell, it's like cinnamon. Lady Jessica notes that her first taste of spice tasted exactly like cinnamon. But later on, Dr. Yu adds that the flavor is never twice the same. It's like life. It presents a different face each time you take it. That's, it, it's basically like having a shroom trip, like, you know, when you take shrooms or acid every every other trip is completely different i guess the taste is also like that <laughs> it depends on your state of mind some hold that the spice produces a learned flavor reaction the body learning a thing is good for it interprets the flavor as pleasurable slightly euphoric and like life never to be truly synthesized but of course, later on, the Chalaxu synthesize it 1500 years into the future, but that's a different video. How is this substance produced by the sandworms? Kynes, the planetologist, tells us that millions of sand trouts die in each spice blow, but the few that survive go into semi-dormant hibernation. After six years, they emerge as small three meter long sandworms. Some of these are known as stunted worms, which don't grow over about nine meters. These are the ones we would witnessed in Dune Part 2. When squeezed and drowned by the Fremen, they excrete the blue water of life which Jessica and Paul overdose on to gain the power called Other Memory. However, worms that aren't stunted become giants that patrol the sands of Arrakis. Their growth takes thousands of years. When complete, they are the sole gods of Dune with unlimited desert power, who are worshipped by the Fremen. However, before I dive into the Fremen culture, we must understand their perspective. The worms become massive, most averaging around 450 meters long, but they can grow to be miles in size. The sandworm that Paul rides in Dune Part 2 is over 1.5 miles in length, but if they are this huge, what do they eat if everything is barren in the desert? Do they attack Fremen settlements or are there other creatures in the desert? Well, the sandworms eat the desert itself. Their mouths, which expands to over 80 meters wide with countless razor sharp teeth, are used as a gaping vacuum to take in rock, rubble, and sand, grinding it all up to be taken inside their stomach. 
As these reactions are taking place, the sand is turned into useful nutrients for the worm's survival. A deep flame is burned inside their body, resulting in their insides being quite warm. However, it's not just the sand, but also the sand planktons within it that provide energy to the worm. Everything comes full circle. The worms start as planktons, but they also become their food later in the cycle. Even upon death through natural means or fighting against another worm, a sandworm disperses into many trouts who will once again become part of this wheel. However, there are only three known ways of killing sandworms. First is of course the use of atomics, whose explosions cover an area large enough to destroy them. Because if you try to use like smaller bombs, they only impact certain segments of the worm. So if you damage one area, then the others can still act. As it's described, like each segment of the worm is a life of its own. The second way to kill a worm is to drown it in water water as it's poison to them, but uh, do y'all see any oceans in Arrakis? Yeah, that method doesn't really work in Arrakis. Finally, the third method is a high voltage electrical shock given to each ring segment, for example. However, the real thing that kills all but one sandworm later in the Dune books are humans themselves. Their greed, their lust for spice and power consume not only the desert culture of Arrakis, but the Shai Hulud themselves in the end. The worms were brought to Arrakis by an ancient race that existed before the foundation of the empire. This group introduced the sand trouts to a beautiful green lush planet with rivers and rain. According to Leto II, after the sand trouts started terraforming Arrakis by insisting waters into their own little pockets, the planet started to turn into what we know now as Dune. Finally, the worms started to emerge leading to the Fremen's desert culture. They call sandworms by many names, Old Man of the Desert, Eternity, Shai Hulud. They are seen as the manifestation of the life force of nature itself and the embodiment of the earth god. The Fremen brothers and sisters die, yet the worms keep on going. They are the foundation of this entire race of people. The worms even give the Fremen hope that even in this harsh environment, life such as theirs can exist and prosper. And if they can, the Fremen can too. All of this culminates on the chosen weapon of the Fremen called the Christ Knife, which are blades crafted from the razor sharp teeth of the worms, showcasing the worms protection. These these knives are so valuable that even off planet they are held in high regard and sell for millions. Although the sandworms are seen as gods to the Fremen, they are also aware of the dangers they impose. So they have perfected the desert dance, which is to walk like the desert, where your footsteps follow the patterns of movement of the sands. Think of the desert as an ocean for the sandworms, where any big ripples in the sand are noticed by them and are attracted to it. An interesting note is that Frank Herbert used used whales as a blueprint to create the movements of the worms. The desert is basically their ocean. The worms are so sensitive to it that even faint, imperfect footsteps can be sensed by them from miles away. However, when the Fremen need to traverse hundreds of miles, they sound off a great big alarm for the worms through the thumpers, which vibrate underground, creating a signal for one of them to emerge. When a worm pops out, the lead rider runs alongside it and grabs onto one of the ring segments, with their maker hook. The hook makes these flaps open, exposing the soft inner tissue of the worm to the rough sands. This irritates the Shai Hulud, causing it to rotate that open flap from its side to its top. Now, you may be wondering, how the heck do they even figure out this shit? Well, as humans, we love to experiment and adapt to our environment. It's like asking, how did the first man find out that that plant was poisonous? Well, he ate it and he suffered. Plus, Frank Herbert doesn't explicitly describe how a friend ends up riding or controlling a sandworm, which is why director Dennis Fielner stated that for Dune Part 2, he created an entirely new concept to depict it and don't worry, he even found out a way to showcase how they get off of these things. Nonetheless, since the rider has hooked on, it means they get lifted up too. Finally, to avoid further irritation, the worm will not burrow underground with exposed tissue, so the Fremen use this technique to ride for hundreds of miles. The riding of worms is so interesting integral to Fremen culture that to become a man, a kid must go through this process as their coming of age ceremony. We witnessed this with Paul, who rode the biggest worm of them all, leading to all of them claiming it was written once again. 
But if you're wondering how they drive this thing, well, Frank Herbert has you covered in that too. As additional hooks can control the direction of the worm's movements and to increase speed, they slap the tail like you would of a horse. However, much like a horse, worms get tired and can only be ridden for a few hundred kilometers or half a day. Once tired, it just sits there like a big ass log until the Fremen dismount and unhook its flaps, allowing the worm to burrow into the sands once again. The ability to control the worms is so overpowered on Arrakis that they were the very reason Paul was able to destroy a whole legion of Sardaukar and Harkonnen troops after the atomic explosions in Dune Part 2. But we have only just started, as their true power is shown to us at the end of Book 3, Children of Dune, where Paul's son, Leto II, becomes a sandworm, or as I like to call it, their final form. We mentioned earlier that Leto II was preborn. This meant he also had Paul's memories and powers, which made him the Kwisatz Haderach and a prophet. However, since his father couldn't go ahead with completing that role, in order to walk the golden path and make sure humanity doesn't destroy itself, Leto II becomes the new Kwisatz Haderach and consumes massive amounts of spice, eventually allowing the sand trouts to cover his entire body. The concentration of spice in his blood fools the trouts as they see him as their own, assimilating themselves within him. This metamorphosis gives Leto insane strength, speed, and protection from other mature sandworms which mistake his body for a deadly mass of water. Leto describes this form as a living, self-repairing still suit of sand trout membrane. With the trouts and the spice they produce perpetually fueling his existence, Leto can live for thousands of years similar to sandworms. In fact, that is not the only power he unlocked. He had complete prescience, which meant Leto had access to all the past lives and every possible future. The golden path was a painful one, not only for the universe, but for the person enacting it as well. Think about it. His humanity is taken away, as in mind, he still has emotions. For example, in his journals, he writes about how much he still loves his sister Ganima, even in this hideous form. But he can't come near other humans or feel their touch because even a few drops of water is poison to him. Every single decision he would make wouldn't be via his emotions or human intellect, but rather a logical one based on something he can't control. He had everything, but nothing at the same time. Control over Spice, the Empire, the Bene Gesserit, and much more, but due to the Golden Path causing so much death and oppression, Leto would be hated by all for the sake of peace and would end up creating it through the Scattering and Sinoa, but wouldn't be allowed to experience or live it himself. There's some Aaron Jaeger shit, bro. He copied my whole fucking flow! Oh. Essentially, over the next 3,500 years, Leto transforms further into a hybrid of human and giant sandworm. By the time of the fourth book, God Emperor of Dune, Leto has exterminated all other sandworms from Arrakis, as it has gradually started turning into a green paradise with water. This is quite ironic for the Fremen, because they prayed for Muad'Dib, the Lisan al-Gaib, and the Prophet to bring water to Arrakis, but after its introduction, their entire entire desert identity is eradicated as there is no use for it. However, the sandworms aren't extinct with Leto's eventual assassination. Just like when a sandworm dies and many sand trouts release themselves onto the cycle once again, the trout in Leto's body do the same. All these modified offsprings are tougher and more adaptable than their predecessors, which allows them to settle and terraform other worlds way more easily. Each one of these trouts carries a tiny pearl of Leto's consciousness, forever trapped in a prescient dream. Over the next 1500 years, Arrakis is once again transformed into a desert due to these modified worms. In Book 5, Heretics of Dune, the mother superior of the Bene Gesserit realizes that Leto's consciousness within the worms still has a hold of humanity and is limiting them. So she uses the conflict against the honored Matras, causes the destruction of Arrakis with only one worm remaining to start the cycle again. But this time, not in Arrakis rather the home planet of Bene Gesserit called Chapter House, then later on to other planets with new worms and more spice. Now this isn't just the source of spice in the entire universe. Due to the monopoly of spice, finding a viable alternative gradually became the focus of certain groups, most notably the Chalaxu. Control of the spice during the Corneo Empire was later eclipsed in scope by the god emperor Leto Atreides. This led to many attempts to synthesize spice 
mice, which eventually yielded positive results for Chalaxu. This happened some 1500 years after Leto's death in the events of Book 5. As a result, the Chalaxu became spice merchants and funded many of their endeavors through the sales of this synthesized spice. And if you guys want to know more about this, including the 10,000 year old lie of the Bene Gesserit, then watch the video on screen right now.